Hi, everyone, and welcome to Design TV by Sandal. This is Product Live with Metropolis, and I'm Ave Rajagopal, Editor-in-Chief in Metropolis. Today, we're going to talk about how office solutions company HumanScale is making an impact with its ocean chairs, which use waste plastic reclaimed from the ocean in their manufacturing. Here to tell us more about this is Jane Abernathy, the Chief Sustainability Officer at HumanScale. Jane, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, thanks. It's great to be here. So Jane, we're here to talk about your ocean chairs, um, but let's take a small step back. Why and how did HumanScale get involved with ocean plastic? We first got involved, um, we, we met, got to know Bureo, which is a group that was um, capturing back nylon from the ocean from fishing nets. Um, and we got to know them because we were taking on the Living Product Challenge. When we were you know, going through that challenge, there are not very many manufacturers who are really willing to take on that very stringent, very, very hard challenge. Um, and we kind of got to know each other from a number of different uh, peers that are kind of in this together. As we started to get to know Boreo, we started to um, think about, could it be possible that we could uh, use some of their material in our products? They had been producing skateboards and sunglasses. And I, in fact, had found that unfortunately they weren't gonna be able to sell enough skateboards and sunglasses to really account for all the material that they could capture. Um, so they decided to shift to becoming more of a supplier of plastic. And we decided to be one of their first partners um, with us, Patagonia and, you know, we know very small number of partners that they decided to partner with and try to see, could we use it in, in long life, durable goods that, that would be on the market and be used for a long time. Of course, you know, a chair is a very different proposition than a sunglasses, especially a office task chair, which is put through rigorous use over and over every day and performed standards. And it's also a very complex product. So it's so incredible that you were able to incorporate this material um, stream into your product manufacturing. Let's dive a little bit into your ocean chairs. Um, which are the three chairs in the ocean chair collection? And can you tell us about how each of them uses um, ocean plastic? Sure. So we have three chairs. We started with Smart Ocean, was the first launched in 2018. Uh, then we expanded to Liberty Ocean, and now we have PATH as well. So all of them include uh, fishing nets, and those nets are captured back, um, or now we sometimes are getting them before they're released into the ocean, so now it's a combination. Um, and they're cleaned up, ground up, um, melted down, turned into pellets, and then um, injection molded into components. So sometimes people think it's the nets that are turned into the mesh for the back of the chairs. Um, it happens to be that that's not the case. It's really some of the hard plastic pieces. So if I point to, for example, this frame, um, that would be you know, an injection molded component. Um, so it's those hard plastic pieces. We've since expanded and now have some other kinds of plastic as well, coming from bottles and from bottle caps. So as we've been expanding the program and working with other suppliers, it's, it's been expanding the kind of plastics we can use. Uh, why was it important for you to explore this material stream, um, you know, plastics retrieved uh, from the ocean or diverted from landing up in the ocean? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It aligned really nicely with, first of all, one of the great passions of our founder. He's really passionate about um, preserving the oceans, preserving wildlife. Um, he spends, in his personal life, he spends a lot of time in, you know, going out to, to wildlife. It's where he likes to be. So, so our founder, Bob King, was, was really um, supportive of this. And then um, it, it also seemed like, a, um, you know, something we've been working towards to using more inputs uh, that are currently considered waste. And when you think about the material in the ocean, it has value as long as you think of it that way. But if, you, if it just, we don't consider that it has value, then it's waste and it floats in the ocean and does so much harm. Fishing nets are the most harmful kind of ocean plastic. They, I think I've heard stats that they can stay in the ocean for up to 200 years. And then they ghost fish and they, they just wreak havoc on the ecosystems. They capture fish and marine life, land on coral reefs and, and just cause a lot of damage. Um, and they're also a significant uh, amount of ocean plastic. So it's around 20% of, of plastic in the ocean seems to be from discarded fishing gear. So it's, it's a significant problem. Um, it, it's a, you know, something that our, our founder is really passionate about. And it just seems like a really good alignment and, and a good project to take on. It's incredible that it's not just about 
um, a waste to you know a useful material kind of story, uh, but that it's also removing waste that causes deep harm um, in the place where it is at the moment. And so it has these amazing co-benefits. Were there any challenges in um, using uh, ocean plastic in manufacturing? I mean, your chairs are known for uh, their precision, for being really high performance, for you know providing an incredible uh, level of uh, ergonomic comfort to their to sitters. Um, you know, these are these are not products. Uh, as I said, like sunglasses, these are products that are, you know, that move <laughs> and, uh, you know, are used day in and day out. So were there any challenges in incorporating ocean plastic in these chairs? You know, it's interesting. Some of the biggest challenges, uh, so let me say, we did have some technical challenges um, and, you know, the materials sometimes had been in the ocean for a while and needed to be dried specially so that it would, would perform properly. Um, and we did make sure that the the ocean plastic chairs meet the same warranty requirements. They're, they are expected to have the same life as the other chairs as well. So we weren't willing to compromise on quality. Um, but I would say some of the biggest challenges were not necessarily technical. Um, getting people to rethink about material in a different way. So the, the you know, initially getting the material that a lot of that work was done by Boreo, getting to the, um, the folks who actually you know, are, are living in the communities that are, are, are fishing. And then even things like importing material from one you know, country to the next and having had it be deemed waste and then they don't want to import it and have you know, much harder time having material move and flow through to all of our different markets. Um, and then even like convincing you know, folks to, to actually take this on and try this pro project with us. So there was this that it was new and a different way of thinking about the material that took a lot of conversations and it took a lot of changing people's mindset. And that was, the, I would say, the biggest challenge, the thing that took us the most time. Well, we're glad that Human Scale put in all that work to, go, to get through all those challenges because, of course, um, now we have this, um, you know, incredible use for material that was previously considered waste. You mentioned the living product challenge uh, at the start of our conversation. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that and you know what it means uh, for your products, but also for the designers who are going to use these products in their projects? So the living product challenge um, is brought up by the International Living Future Institute. And it's the, as far as I can see, the most stringent um, product assessment on the market. So what it's not asking for us to be neutral as a manufacturer, it's actually asking for us to leave a positive impact. And that's the only certification or challenge or standard that I've seen that, that asks manufacturers to do that. And it really changes who manufacturers are in the world. Instead of leaving the world, you know, we sort of assume that manufacturing is going to cause a little bit of damage and hope that we can do less damage, but assume that it's always going to be there. This is the first time I've seen someone asking, can you manufacture product and also clean the world up a little bit while you're doing it so that as you're manufacturing, the world is better off because you're there and better off because you're operating and you're doing this. It's really a phenomenal, I think very exciting to say, could we ask manufacturers to be cleaning up the world instead of assuming that they have to leave it a little bit worse and a little bit more damaged? So that was a rigorous audit, a rigorous process to go through. But, but I think it's really exciting that it's possible to ask that of manufacturers. And then that's maybe one thought I'd like to leave with designers and architects is that what you ask for is what manufacturers respond to. And it's, your, your influence is really strong. You might not get the change next week or see it for the project directly you're working on today. Um, but when you're asking for it and when you let suppliers and manufacturers know that this is influencing your purchasing decisions, that you have made cho choices based on sustainability and this is important to you, then it does, it sends a really strong signal. It changes what manufacturers do. When we change our operations, all of our choices are repeated hundreds of thousands of times a year. So, so I can't emphasize enough the huge amount of impact that architects and designers have and how much power you have to really make, you know, make influence on how the on manufacturing, which influences you know, the world that we live in and the impacts that we have. Absolutely. You know, we're all in this together. And one of the key ways in which we can make a difference uh, 
to our planet, to our society, is by acting in our professional sphere and taking these decisions because each of our decisions, as you just said, has this multiplying uh, benefit uh, along the supply chain. So, you know, one step at a time, one chair at a time, if you will. Um, is there anything else that designers need to know if they're considering ocean chairs, the three ocean chairs um, for their next project? It's worth knowing the amount of positive impact you have. So I think that's kind of interesting. We tend to, we try to, um, if, you know, if someone has a project, we can let them know just how much plastic was pulled out of the ocean for the project that they have. And I think some of these things can be kind of interesting to see. Um, and it's, it's also interesting to share that. So somebody sitting in the chair might not necessarily know. So I think communication is really important to, to you know, share that story and let people be excited about the, the good choices that are being made. And, you know, just to add to that, I think the level of documentation and third party verification that human scale has gone through for your products makes it easier for designers to reliably uh, know, um, you know, exactly what their impact is for, for a project overall. So, you know, I think and that's, that's something um, architects and designers maybe have not had the tools very long to do, uh, but now we have this measurable way and that measurement is based on uh, the work that you've been doing um, at Human Scale. So thank you so much for that as well. For all of you who are watching us today, um, if you want to know more about uh, the ocean chairs, head on over to humanscale.com. That's humanscale.com uh, for more details. Thank you so much, Jane, for joining me today. And thanks everyone for joining us. Have a great day.